Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, um, where you'll find an array of services, resources, and activities going on for the global medcoms community, by which I mean the um, uh, medical or people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing around the world. Um, uh, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is running these Zoom meetings, which is a great way of involving lots more people uh, from all over. Um, and today I'm absolutely delighted that we are welcoming uh, Lee and Phil and Tracy from Ogilvy Health to talk about medical education. Um, so uh, without further ado, if I can hand over to Lee, um, who will introduce and start the presentation. Lee, over to you. So hello everybody, um, my name is Lee van Beek, I'm Director of Learning at um, Ogilvy Health and I'm here with my colleagues Phil and Tracy. So I'm going to kick us off um, today with a bit of an, a macro overview of the healthcare ecosystem and really there's never been a more exciting time to be working in healthcare. Interestingly we seem to have arrived at peak illness at about the same time as we've, re as we've arrived at a desire for peak wellness. So peak illness, as we know, is being driven by aging populations and unhealthy behaviours becoming the norm. The World Health Organization predicts that next year, chronic diseases will account for 60% of the global burden of disease. At the same time, our desire for uh, self-monitoring and a love of wearable technologies means that wellness expenditure is growing really quickly at 20% year on year. All the while, belief in scientific evidence is at an all-time low. Uh, we live in a post-Trump, post-truth world, and I think this is best uh, illustrated um, with the example of vaccines. So 200 years post the discovery of the vaccine by Jenners, which changed the landscape of healthcare altogether, the World Health Organization has listed vaccine hesitancy as one of its top uh, threats to public health in 2019. But perhaps the biggest challenge that the healthcare industry faces is one of affordability. So recently, Novartis had the most expensive drug ever approved by the FDA. So this is a, a, a gene therapy called Zolgesma, um, which costs more than $2 million per treatment round. And this is really making us rethink how we talk about value. Um, so just to bring this into the context of uh, our, the, our client world, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, what does this mean for the clients that we're working with on a daily basis? So for many of them, they're feeling the commercial pressures um, and they're having to demonstrate value for money more and more, not only in terms of their products that they develop, but also in terms of their medical education initiatives. We're also finding that their team makeup is changing. So more and more, they're looking to agency as experts to hold their hands through these interesting times. Thank you, Lee. So I just thought I'd, I'd tell you a little bit about um, what we've been doing over the last six or seven years. I mean, while, um, and we've seen certainly from the vaccines experience that Lee was talking about, that education is absolutely critical if, if we're to, to help and our clients and, and the healthcare community um, in, in what we do. So um, we understand that education is important, but actually it's the means to an end goal rather than the end goal itself. So um, we changed up a little bit of what we did in our, in our medical education team. Uh, of course, we have to have the biomedical science, that's a given for all of us. But increasingly, the learning sciences and the cognitive and behavioral sciences are, are really important for us to be able to deliver effective education that actually drives change. So they are absolutely critical. We've got a great team of specialists, Lee, Lee being part of our team, uh, and we're really pleased to be able to, to add these extra dimensions to the work that we're doing with clients. So on the next slide, um, I think the other thing that absolutely underpins what we do is, is being able to have impact and being creative. And so again, within our Ogilvy Health team, we work seamlessly with, with other specialist colleagues, both in digital and social, in our multi-channel planning. Um, we have a really great creative team from conceptual designers to experiential designers and graphic designers and data comprehension designers. So we're really lucky to have this as part of our team. And I, I do think being able to, to offer this kind of seamless solution is something that very much resonates with clients these days. 
And of course, uh, in terms of what we do, the science is great and everything that we do has to have an evidence base. But actually, if we can't be creative, um, then actually we're not going to achieve what we need to do for our clients and not have the impact that we need. And by creativity, uh, we don't just mean kind of great, um, great graphic design or, or, or ideas, but it's bringing those ideas to fruition. Sometimes that can be quite challenging, um, but, uh, you know, it's something that we're always aiming to do. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about um, Ogilvy Health and how we approach things. So to sort of navigate us through the rest of, of, of the session today, I wanted to share a little bit with you how the pharmaceutical industry um, invests in medical education. So this is a graphic that is taken from GSK website. It's in the public domain and it really illustrates how third party education for healthcare professionals is funded. So really um, medical education falls into two distinct categories, um, independent and non-independent. So in the independent space, um, it's funded through an un, uh, uh, unrestricted educational grant. The pharmaceutical industry will be entirely hands off. They'll have no um, say in speakers, content, agenda, um, any faculty involved, venues. Whereas in the non-independent space, which is largely where um, we do a lot of our work, um, the programs are client-led. Um, the content is focused on the product and around disease awareness. And the key point I wanted to make on this slide was that actually best practice um, in educational excellence, we've noticed over the last few years, has been driven, driven out of the independent space. But actually creativity and innovation flourishes in the non-independent space. And we think that there's a lot of cross pollination that can be happening in these two categories to really drive effective um, and best practice education. So this is a quote um, from an expert in medical education who facilitated a workshop for us last year and I think it really gets to the nub of what it is that we are striving for at, at Ogilvy Health. Um, so, so the quote just reads, the pharmaceutical industry and the discipline of medicine have not always been good at leveraging the evidence from other spheres, such as the social sciences, adult learning, and educational psychology. And we really believe that if you combine evidence-based medicine, because we are in an era of evidence-based medicine at the moment, with evidence-based education, we can really strive for better um, health outcomes for patients. So what do we mean by evidence-based education? So a lot of the work that we do um, is grounded in medical education best practice. This is the 2017 position paper, which was published by Tamara Allen and her colleagues. And what they did was they brought together medical education experts from 16 pharmaceutical companies to um, sort of lay out a set of quality principles that could be applied um, across medical education broadly, so not only in the independent or the non-independent space, but across the spectrum of activities. And it goes into a lot of detail around sort of the principles and the recommendations. Um, but just to give you a flavor, we've listed a few on the left-hand side of the slide here. So things like being learner-centric and delivering education that's really relevant to learners, um, the use of adult learning principles, the application of learning or instructional design techniques, so that includes defining specific and measurable learning objectives, um, and then the use of active learning techniques within medical education to really enhance learning impact. So I'd love to be able to talk to you about all these aspects, but um, being short of time, we're going to dive into the first one, which is really about how we can move from a content-centric to a learner-centric approach. Um, so this is a picture that was taken in the 1900s um, in Austria, and it's a physician lecture. And I think anyone who's attended a Congress in the last few years will be very familiar with this picture. So we have our KOL or our expert clinician at the front of the stage who is sharing the evidence or his knowledge um, with the delegates or the people in attendance, so healthcare professionals typically. And what this sort of represents is a transfer of knowledge. And this absolutely has a place in medical education. Um, in terms of disseminating the latest clinical data and the latest evidence. But what we now know from behavioral psychology is that knowledge transfer alone is often not enough to change behavior within clinical practice. And as medical educators, we need to be asking ourselves a different question. We need to be asking, where is it that we want our clinicians to be 
What do we want them to think, to know, um, to be doing differently as a result of having worked through a medical education program? So we want to start with the end in mind. So at Ogilvy, we use a process called backwards planning. Um, this is a well-known process in the, the area of educational psychology. Um, and it's really qu actually quite straightforward, a three-phase process. The first thing you do is try to work out where you're going. What is it that you want to achieve? What are the sort of desired outcomes that you, you hope, hope to achieve through your medical education program? And we call this the desired state. The second step is how will you know when you've arrived there? So what will be acceptable evidence of the outcomes? What measures will you have? Um, and then only then in the third phase do we start to plan learning or plan medical education. So what format, materials and resources are best suited to accomplish these goals? So for example, things like your symposia, interprofessional education, global faculty development, case-based learning. Um, so that's the, th the three phase process. The next step is to undertake a needs analysis or a needs assessment. So this looks at what should be happening in clinical practice, i.e. that desired state versus what is currently happening. And the best way to illustrate this is through an example. So this was published in 2013 by Zisblatt and his colleagues. And it's, it's a nice example of sort of an elegant gap analysis in practice. And it looks at osteop osteoporosis screening um, in the US. So the national guidance in the US is that um, all women over the age of 65 years old um, when they come into clinic should be assessed for bone mineral density using a DEXA scan. And that is um, the guidance that's offered by, by, the, by the US national guidelines. Um, a clinic in Boston audited their practice data and what they actually found was that only 58.4%, so the number on the left, of women over the age of 65 were being offered that DEXA scan. So we noted a gap of 40%, roughly 40% of women weren't um, being offered the, the, the scan as per the clinical guidance. So our job as medical educators is to, to really try and understand what sits behind that gap. Is it a lack of knowledge? So are clinicians not aware of the guidance or not aware of how to implement the guidance within their clinical practice? Is it a lack of skills? So that could be clinical reasoning skills, so not sure how to transfer that guidance into clinical practice and, and sort of uh, implement uh, correct de clinical decisions or an inability to do the DEXA scans or perhaps it's a motivational issue or it may even be a systems issue. So were there barriers in place at the clinic that were preventing the clinicians from, from following that guidance? And only then when we have a really good sense of what sits behind that gap in clinical practice, um, can we look at, at interventions to, to, to fill that gap um, and, and design medical education appropriately. So I'm gonna stop there with the theory. Um, and just to say, you know, so the last thing from me really is that, you know, we do a lot of work within the four walls um, of, of our organization in Ogilvy Health. We also try and tap into the, an international community in medical education. And there's a lot of work been done by the Global Alliance for Medical Education um, in best practice um, in MedEd. And my colleague, Jo, sits on the board of directors um, at GAME. And part of the work that she's doing is developing a competency framework for global medical educators to really try and raise the bar of what we're doing across agency and the industry as a whole. So I'm going to now hand over um, to Tracy, who's going to talk a little bit more about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Just to meet my phone. Thanks, Lee. Um, this is just an example, actually, a little bit of a, a mix of the types of, of work that we've done that that bring in the principles that Lee, Lee's been talking about. And I think what's clear there is it's, we're not talking necessarily about something new, new. This is about doing the things that we all do uh, for our clients every day, but actually doing them better and more effectively. And just one example of that, this is a mix between in-person and synchronous um, training to online and, and any, you know, uh, when you want to go in and watch um, uh, the events. Um, but bottom right there, I think that's a good example, Lee, of um, when we're talking about a gap analysis. So the series of six um, iBooks that you see there were developed um, on the insight that our MSLs, for, for our clients, were great at their knowledge with their product and the disease area, but their confidence and skills around talking with physicians about the clinical decisions that they make at the different points when they need to intervene. 
um, was not great. So these series of books were all based on the, the, the six clinical decision points, and it really flipped their learning much more into the into the physician's mind. So, so some good examples, I think, of, of how we've used um, both the learning theory and um, the behavioral psychology to apply to some of the everyday things that we do. Phil, I think I'm passing over to you. That's right. So thanks very much. Um, so how are we upskilling our staff to deliver this uh, medical education? Uh, medical education writing tends to be a little bit different from, um, from MedCom's writing. And so we need to take all this theory um, and really have our writers apply the best practice principles we've been talking about. And we've been evolving a writer's academy based on the competency framework from the uh, Global Alliance for Medical Education, um, and therefore taking very much a sort of learner-centric approach to um, developing our writers over, over the course of time. And you know, we identify, uh, identify the challenges um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ensure that our writers have the particular skills necessary. So it's really the um, backwards planning that Lee was mentioning earlier put into practice. Um, so that is the end of our presentation. Um, if we'd like to go on to the last slide, those are our contact details um, for, the, uh, for the team here today. But at this point, I will hand back to Peter. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, and if we can lose the slides, Lee. That's great. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, just for those people who are listening to this online, can I just um, make the point that you've got at the bottom of your window, you've got a chat button on the Q&A button. If you call those up, there's a text box. Um, send any observations, comments, or questions in via either of those two means, and we'll all see those. And very much with these webinars, we're, we're keen to get those questions and to be led by you guys in the audience so send in some questions um, I, I if I'm gonna start off um, and I should possibly uh, well I will <laughs> uh, put my cards on the table uh, not everyone will know that I was the founder of European CME forum with uh, Eugene and uh, so I've, I've got a bit of a history of getting a bit excited about medical education as opposed to other sorts of medcoms work and so on yeah um, but um, and, and we should say the European CME Forum meeting is this week, actually, uh, while we're talking. Um, so, um, I, I, as I say, I don't want to sort of like, um, what's the word here? I, I don't want to, well, anyway, I just, I just want to ask a couple of simple questions. Um, I mean, I've got a background with the CME and medical education. There's a, there's a history in MedComs um, of, of calling ourselves medical education agencies, med ed agencies, using the term medical education very freely. Um, I just wonder, without me trying to put words in your mouth, how you feel about the terminology. Um, can, can you comment on that? Maybe look back a little bit on where the business has come from. It was med ed, everything was medical education, but it wasn't really. So how do you feel about that? Have you got any comments on that and, and how it's evolved? I, I don't know who wants to, to take a lead so on I that. Shall I start, Lee? Yeah, go on, Tracy. Go on. Peter, I think you're absolutely right. And I think part of our realization about six or seven years ago is we use this term medical education but really are we and and that was one of the driving forces behind us actually using our scientific background because we are evidence-based to really um, home grow and bring in additional expertise so that we really can um, claim to be medical educators and we are rather than just communicators of scientific data so no a really good point Lee I don't know if you and Phil if you want to add uh, just to say I completely I completely agree with you Tracy we sort of had this realization that we had a really strong um, sort of uh, expertise in the medical side of things but perhaps the educational side of things was lacking and you know we, we do draw a lot from the CME world and how to sort of uh, follow best practice principles but as I said earlier you know there's also a lot to be taken from the work that we were doing already in terms of bringing that creativity and innovation to the space of medical education we can have a tendency to be a bit dry sometimes so there's a nice balance to be struck there okay Phil have you got a comment and I wasn't sure if you're going to say something there sorry Nope. And what, so, so just following that line of thought for a minute, um, you know, medical education to me is much more about defining those needs which you, you've outlined um, and measuring outcomes, which maybe you didn't talk so much about. Um, but um, 
well, one of the conf well, one of the, so I've got a couple of questions in there. One is uh, when you go to your typical client, uh, or when you're sitting with your typical client, you're talking about a medical education project. There can be an awful lot more involved in a medical education project than some people appreciate. When you start talking gap analysis and the work involved and all the rest of it, again, just looking for some some honest opinion here. Um, you know, how many clients kick back against that sort of thing and sort of say, "Oh, for goodness sake, it's just a it's just a training course. You know, let's just get on. We know we need to do it." Sort of thing. Do you get involved in those sorts of conversations and give us a flavour of maybe how how some of them play out if you can? I'm, I'm intrigued about what happens in practice. Should I take this one, Tracy? Yeah, you so, 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 so just to say, I think we sort of get a, a spectrum of clients. So we get a lot of our clients who are very engaged with the idea of best practice in education and bringing those principles in. And then we get some other clients who, for many of them, it'll be the first time they're hearing this type of thing and may or may not be receptive to it, largely depending on, on sort of the wiggle room on budgets and that type of thing. As I said, the commercial pressures to sort of demonstrate value for money um, is often what leads the conversation. Um, I think also, what, just coming back to the idea of outcomes, outcomes, especially in the world of behavior change, are uh, behavior change is complex and messy. And you know, any clients who are sort of striving for behavior change, it's gonna be difficult to measure those outcomes in real, real practice. So what we're trying to do is sort of put forward that there is a value in, in, in thinking about these things, assigning the budget to these things, but it is going to be a journey that we go on with our clients. Um, and not always that easy to measure those type of things. But also and, and so, the, many, so many clients sorry. are looking for, you know, measures of the success of their projects, of their programs. So if we can bring classic um, measures of, of outcomes of medical education to them, then we're already addressing what they want to see to be able to talk to their colleagues and um, you know senior managers. Okay, okay. Try and then maybe just one please. final comment on that. Um, sorry, Peter. Just one final comment on that. I think what we're doing increasingly is working at the strategic educational planning level with clients because in one event um, you can apply principles, but you, you, the change is not likely to happen. So we're working with clients on one, three, five-year plans. Um, of how to address those gaps. Okay, because again, all that work does stretch the timetables out of it, so you sort of need to think ahead of yourself, don't you? Um, and then again, following the logic, um, you uh, put educational projects together and then you're up against sort of code of practice type issues. Um, I think I'm right in saying I'm a little bit out of date, so as I always say, there's lots I'm ignorant about, so excuse me for showing my ignorance here, but I think it was the last FBA code, which would have been earlier this year, which was the first time they'd even mentioned and, and sort of talked about education or something. So one of the problems that I've, I've seen discussed in the past is this conflict between trying to do genuine educational work, whether it's CME or non-CME, whatever, but the conflict basically when it gets to the, within the company, which is all about a promotional code of practice, which is different, again, just maybe a couple of observations from you on how that works in practice and where it's going. Is FPO just, and, 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 and pharma industry just opening its mind to education being different? Is that a direction we're going down now? Sorry, I'm looking at Lee, do you want to say that one? Sorry, I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick a panelist. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it does sort of largely depend um, what teams you're working with uh, within the pharmaceutical industry, you know, whether you're working at a brand team level or whether you're working with your medical affairs team. I think there's definitely um, a, a lot more, um, I guess, um, I, suppose, I suppose the word is uh, acceptance of sort of bringing you know, the, the educational uh, best practice into that space. Um, I have to admit, uh, in terms of code of practice, I'm as up to date as, as I have been with my, 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 my latest training, but not really sure exactly if I understand your comment, Peter, about the link between the code of practice and, and the educational activities. Um, well, I suppose the, the conflict is if you're looking at everything like it's a detail aid, yeah. then that causes some problems in some people's heads as to whether as to what's appropriate and, and acceptable and so on um i'm using a slightly simplistic way of approaching it but it's a promotional code of practice yeah, absolutely. which brings in a very different sort of um, mindset in terms of i don't know messaging and all sorts of stuff and the rights and wrongs of that as opposed to education and wherever on the spectrum of education you are um that's that's different 
Yeah, absolutely. So we are doing some, we are bringing these principles into some of the work that we are doing with brand teams. And then we are absolutely mindful then of any sort of um, regulations and promotional codes of practice that we need to have in place. So, you know, um, really transparent and being clear about where the funding source is and the, and the involvement of, of a pharmaceutical company. But that doesn't mean that we can't still apply education based practice principles, you know, being really clear about what the unmet needs are, consider what, what it is that healthcare professionals are attending an event or a small meeting would want to hear and, and balance that with the commercial objectives of the company. And actually there is, there lies in the difficulty because, you know, obviously our, our clients are going to have commercial objectives and we need to marry those with the educational objectives. And I think that's where we, we, we do our best work actually. Okay. Both sets of, uh, of expertise in. Okay. So Susie's just saying another aspect is quizzes, which are great for interactivity learning, but can be banned under the API code of practice, for instance. So, yeah. so like you say, there's a getting a balance between what you can do, what you want to do, and, and so on and so forth. Um, just to pick up on Steve's questions here, just to start picking up on the questions that come in. Um, Steve's asking about outcomes and so on. Um, that's uh, he's, he's got, I think that's a two-part question. So just, just uh, simply, Philip, you talk about classic outcomes. What was your definition of classic outcomes? So um, really, I mean, yeah, like, you know, how many bums on seats when you run a meeting? Well, sort of exactly, thing, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I mean, the, the classic things you, you measure are for a symposium and responsiveness to questions and, and this sort of thing. I Lee, think do you also, want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Just to sort of mention that I think the success of a medical education program can be thought of on two levels. The one is assessment of learning and the other is the outcomes. And I think the knowledge gain or the competency gain or what the individuals attending or being part of an educational event take away from it, that is a learning that you will assess on an individual or a group level. The outcomes of the event relate more to what, what Phil was talking about, which is the attendance, the satisfaction, you know, um, metrics that you will measure, that type of thing, and, and is slightly different to the learning. So I would actually group them separately into assessment and outcomes. Okay, and do you guys talk in terms of the Moore's pyramid, yes, in do. terms of, yeah, so basically do. have they attended or, and does yeah, everyone know what Moore's, sorry, can you, you'll do it better than me, can you start to, and now, now I've mentioned it, can you just sort of articulate what the Moore's um, pyramid is all about in terms of measuring outcomes, is that right? Sure, so, so Moore's pyramid sort of um, illustrates seven outcome levels uh, for a medical education programme. Um, I think it was traditionally applied in the CME space, but more and more it's being applied in the non-independent space. And going from the top of the pyramid, it's um, public health, patient health, um, and then you've got uh, competencies um, within a clinical setting, and then you've got knowledge and skill within an educational setting, um, and then you've got satisfaction and participation. So if you have to sort of consider a classic symposia, um, a lot of symposia are really only designed to meet the bottom two layers of the pyramid. So did people come? Yes, okay, tick. Bums on seats, as you said, Peter. And did they enjoy the event? Tick. But that's not really sort of a measure of what people would have taken away. Are they going to apply that in clinical practice? And we've had quite a lot of discussion internally about what you can actually achieve in a symposium. So knowledge transfer, absolutely. Would that be assessed on an evaluation form at the end? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you can also impart clinical reasoning skill within the symposia. So using case-based learning, um, uh, sort of using sort of more active learning techniques like reflect, pair, share and improving dialogue. So the idea is to look at Moore's Pyramid and consider at what level your intervention is aimed at and then design the intervention to actually achieve that. So okay, okay. some of those quality principles that were outlined in that 2017 paper go into a lot of detail there. And again, just drawing on my experience on the CME side specifically, they, the, as you go up that pyramid, it gets harder and harder and harder to really meet those criteria and more and more expensive, which yes. can, you know, can become an issue. Um, but I, would, I mean, I would like to think we're a long way behind, a long way ahead, sorry, <laughs> of where maybe when I started Medcoms, we literally had satellite symposiums and, the, and the, purely the criteria was, was it a full room or not? I mean, that, you know, it would be nice to think we're beyond that nowadays, generally. Um, so fingers crossed. Be on, but it's still required. <laughs> is, is, okay, to okay. You, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that's that. Not, I accept that's that. just the base. Peter, if, if I may, if I could just come back to that example that I gave of the needs assessment, which looked at the um, osteoporosis screening in the clinic. That's a nice example of how you can take 
um, sort of practice data and consider what's happening in clinical practice and actually affect a change at patient or, po or population health level because whatever changes happen in that practice will directly impact on the patients so whether that you know once we sort of get a sense of what was behind that 40 percent of of women not achieving or not being offered the DEXA scan, you know, maybe education in, in terms of a knowledge gain is appropriate, but maybe we need to do something a little bit different um, and consider what's happening in practice. So there are ways in which you can do that. So interventions that you can propose that would be more, more suitable. Okay, I'm with you. Okay, I'm just going to ask a question. Someone who's asked a question there to see whether I can. Uh, clarify that question over there and um, steve's asking we're thinking the outcomes slightly here and maybe we anyone got a specific comment about this we're heading into rare diseases here so how do you measure belief and attitude change following non-independent medical education specifically in rare diseases so that, that i guess that brings up specific challenges and opportunities there you can talk to the rare diseases area a bit yeah i mean well you're going to have um dispersed healthcare professionals across the globe. So not everyone's going to be in one place. You're going to have specialists that are sort of dotted all over the place. Um, I think in some ways they're actually, because they're a smaller group, if you're creative and how you bring them together, an easier group to manage in some ways, as opposed to sort of if you're dealing with diabetes or you know, other chronic illness where you're going to have thousands and thousands of specialists sort of all over the world globally. So in some ways, actually rare diseases can can be you know a better area to be working in in terms of shifting beliefs and behaviors i think um peer-to-peer -peer work um is is successful in the rare disease space so um really thinking about interventions whereby you have um, experts learning from experts is is uh, sort of proven to be more motivational and can shift behaviors so that's just one one perspective from me i don't know if for the rest of the panel is anything else to add there Anybody? No, Can no, see? I think that's fine. Um, there is a question, Peter, which was around the nudge approach, and, and, and I think from somebody called Rachel. So, Rachel, yes, we have experience of using the nudge approach. It's something. <laughs> All right, okay. Years. All right, my hands up then. I just, I just asked Rachel to clarify the nudge approach. I don't know what nudge <laughs> approach is. So, can you explain that for me and anybody else like me? <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's around automatic thinking. So, it, it's really about we we've been talking a lot about education, and and that's our rational part of our brain that is taking that information and using it and behaving on that. But we also all um, have heuristics and biases. And um, we, we don't often, or we, we, we often don't act in the way that our rational minds would expect us to do. And there are various behavioral techniques, um, including a lot um, through Public Health England that we're all exposed to that, that are used. And we would use those within our programs and also to help us uh, construct programs. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a really key part of, of education and, and being effective in what we do. Okay, great. Thank you very much <laughs> for helping me answer that as well. Um, let's just go back. I thought this was potentially quite an interesting question. Um, the, you're talking about upskilling writers. Um, Phil, I think it was you that was talking about that. Yep. And can we just explore that a little bit um, in terms of what you mean? Um, I guess Absolutely. there might be some Medcoms writers sitting there going, what? What do I need to know? Uh, what, what, can you just talk a bit about yeah. that? Say what you're looking no, at? very much so. Um, and I mean, I, my a lot of my background is in med, regular medcoms agencies. So um, you know, doing publications and symposia and advice <coughs> and so on. And um, really, the the upskilling I'm talking about here, the upskilling is sort of the processes and the thinking that we've been talking about on the seminar today. Um, and that process of, of backwards planning. But we also partner with um, design, uh, design universities, design departments and, um, and psychology departments to really understand the latest thinking in these areas and, and relating to adult learning and so on. So it's, it's taking it from the writing that one would usually do in a medcoms agency to um, more of these processes of learning um, and um, taking taking information on board. Just also at a very basic level, I think, so, I, so I, my background is I came through the ranks of agency as a writer. So I started as a junior writer and uh, moved all the way through to, you know, principal writer before taking on my current role. So I understand exactly what it means to be a writer in agency. And 
um, I think what we're talking about here is something as basic as being able to write a learning objective. So how you would write that using active verbs um, so that it's concise, so that it's um, specific, measurable, etc. And for, for a lot of writers that might seem, seem obvious, but for others it might not be, how to write an evaluation form so that it's not only assessing just the two bottom tiers of Moore's pyramid, but it's also thinking about the knowledge gain, um, how to construct um, a piece of educational material that is applying some some learning design techniques so thinking how to keep it concise how to um, if, especially if you're sort of doing training type stuff as well how that looks so I think more and more the diversity of writing um, is is becoming greater and writers are going to need to turn their hand to something more than just an agenda or a set of slides um, or a publication. You know, we, we're working on a lot of different types of materials now, um, case-based learning being another example. So how you would construct a clinical case that's not just about saying, okay, the, you know, patient 50 years presented with this blood pressure, these heart rates, you know, it's really about narrative and storytelling. And these are all skills that we think writers are going to need going forward to respond to our client requests. Okay, thanks. Tracy, have you got any comment on that front? And from the point of view of running yeah. the agency, do you have to recruit different sorts of people than you might have done, or is it a question of training them? Well, we do. I think we, what we've done is we're bringing in a broader range of people. Um, but I think what we're really talking about here is our continual professional development. So it's, it's not just what we bring in, that the, 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 the kind of our evolving writers academy is about continual professional development. And actually, it came back to a really simple slide that Lee showed early on, where we said, you know, to be effective for, for physicians and to improve clinical outcomes, we have to combine evidence-based medicine with evidence-based education so it's bringing the knowledge up on evidence-based education and our skills in applying it in a creative way that you know has impact so so yeah it's uh, it's exciting it's, it's good to be able to do some of these things often we spend at my my level our times with the strictures of procurement and all those kind of things and you know to continue to move forward I think is what keeps us all all going and you know is, is the enjoyment in the job Excellent. Okay, look, guys, I've got an eye on the clock, and I think that's a, probably a, quite a good point to um, to end on a positive note. So, uh, so can I um, can I just for the purposes of the recording say thank you very much to the speakers. Um, the audience, please don't all rush away unless you have to, because we'll we're quite happy to keep talking to the the top of the hour, as it were. Um, uh, Lee, Philip, Tracy, thank you very much for joining us. I'm, I'm assuming you're happy for people to reach out on LinkedIn and make contact and so on. That way is the easy way. Um, so hopefully people do that. Um, thank you very much for joining in. Um, on that note, I'm going to finish. Uh, I should say, uh, if anybody's watching this either online or in, in, in real time today, um, if you miss any of these videos, come to Network Pharma TV. Um, where you'll find um, hundreds now, a couple of hundred videos of one sort or another. Um, and medcomsnetworking.com obviously is the source of information about pretty much everything uh, that you need to know about medcoms, basically. So hopefully see you there. Right, so on that note, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, what I like to do here is stop the recording and have everybody just give a little wave. Bye-bye. Okay, so bye-bye. <laughs>